Hey, I'm Cameron, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad that you are here and would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some of our upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. I do want to welcome you. My name is Noble. I am our Connections Pastor here. Uh, pastor Caleb is, is out. Uh, I believe he's on his way to catch a flight to California to go preach to a bunch of students. Um, I don't know who would go to California when it's 85 degrees here. Um, it's miserable, and so good for him. But be praying for him, church, all right? Be praying for him as he's going to California uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with students out there at that camp. It is very exhausting for him, I know, but what an awesome opportunity. So be praying for our pastor as he is gone. And um, this morning, we are continuing on in our series in Nehemiah. And this morning, we will be in Nehemiah chapter 9. Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, I would encourage you to turn there. It'll be up on the screen as well. Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Um, we read, now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sin and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and for another quarter of it they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. And so I want to set the context for what is going on here. So last week in chapter 8 we talked about the Feast of Booths being reinstituted there within the people of Israel. And so here we are, 24th day of the month, so we're two days after the Feast of Booths. And the people are wearing sackcloth, right? The people of Israel are assembled and they are fasting and they are wearing sackcloth. Now fasting, the whole point of fasting is that we are not just trying to lose weight, right? Fasting is not about a diet. Fasting is not about, hey, it's January 1st, I'm going to start fasting. No. Fasting, when we look at God's word, what is it about? It is about a time of sacrifice where we are not eating. We are giving up so that we can focus on what? Those times when we feel those urges of hunger or needing something, they are focusing on their walk with the Lord. That is what they are doing, a time of sitting back, stepping back, and just focusing in prayer and worship to God to realign their hearts for what he has planned. And they are wearing sackcloth. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't daily wear sackcloth. It's not very comfortable, okay, church? This sackcloth is a very rough material, a very coarse material, rags. There is nothing glamorous about wearing sackcloth, but they are taking this point of almost humiliation, if you will, right? Stripping all the pride, all the self out of this. So what? So that they can focus on the Lord. This is how the people are preparing their hearts. And then it says that they have earth on their head, right? So dirt, we have dirt is on their head. And this was a sign of humiliation and shame, because what is happening here, what is going to transpire within this passage is a time of true confession and repentance for their sins. This is what the people of Israel are assembled for, a true time of repentance and confession for their sins. And so we see as we continue on in verse 4 that they are gathered together on the 
steps and they proclaim and they all say, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Now, I love how Pastor Caleb talked two weeks ago in in chapter eight, man, having you stand up for three hours while we read the book of the law, right? Just how crazy that seems. But for a quarter of the day, for three hours, they are standing as they're reading the book of the law, right? The Pentateuch, the first five books of God's word. And then for the other three hours, as we read there at the end of verse three, they are confessing their sins and their iniquities, right? They are confessing their sins and worshiping the Lord. And so the leaders are on the steps and they are reading and they are proclaiming and they say, stand up and bless the Lord your God. And then what happens over the course of verses 6 through 31, 6 through 31, we have three different sections here within this passage. If you're taking notes, you can go ahead and chunk this out. But in verses 6 through 8, the leaders are going through the Abrahamic covenant. In verses 6 through 8, they go through the Abrahamic covenant, the time of Abraham. In verses 9 through 21, they are going to go through the time of Exodus. They're going to go through the time of the Mosaic covenant. And then verses 22 through 31, we go through the time of conquest with Joshua and the judges. And so, beginning in verse 6, as they are standing As they are all assembled and standing and reading from the book of the law, we read in verse 6, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So they're declaring creation. They're declaring creation, right? You, Father, you alone, God, have created the heavens and the earth. You have created the heavenly host, the angels. You have created all of the living creatures, the sea, right? And all of the hosts of heaven worship you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promises, for you are righteous. And so here, the people are being reminded of the covenant made with Abraham. And if we go to Genesis 15... You can write it down. You can go read Genesis 15. We have where the Lord is speaking to Abraham, where he calls Abraham and he declares, I am going to make you a great nation. I am going to number you more than the stars in the sky. This is the covenant promise that God made with Abraham, the beginning of the people of Israel's history here, starting out with Father Abraham right? And so they're remembering this. And I love at verse 8, at the very end, and you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. The Lord has continued to keep his promise through what? Through the people's disobedience, right? Because they are standing here in a time of confession and repentance. We must remember this time of confession and repentance that the people of Israel are standing before. This is why they are experiencing these hardships and oppression in their lives during this time here in Nehemiah because of their disobedience from the Lord, because they have forsaken their covenant obligations that they confessed and that they are held to with the Lord. But he has kept his promise for he is righteous. And he continues on in verse nine, and you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. And you performed many wonders, right? We know this. We go through the book of Exodus. We know this story well of Moses in Egypt, We have the plagues, Moses declaring from the Lord, let my people go, 
right? He performed all these wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, all the people of the land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them. We had the Red Sea being divided so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waves. Just an incredible reminder, right? Not only did the Lord rescue them from being under Pharaoh's grip, from being under oppression in Egypt, but he split the Red Sea so that the millions of Israelites could cross. And then the waves came and they fell into the depths and they fell into the depths as they were consumed. Why? Because the Lord kept his promise and he is faithful. And then by a pillar of cloud in verse 12, you led them by day and by a pillar of fire, you led them by night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down from Sinai and spoke to them from heaven and gave them the right rules and true laws, good statutes and commands. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go and possess the land that you had sworn to give in them, okay? And so right there, in verse 15 at the end, he says, go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give in them. And this goes back to the promise of Abraham there in verse eight, right? This was the promise that God gave to Abraham. I am going to make you a great nation and you will go and you will go to this promised land that I have prepared for you. And so we remember Moses, they come out of Egypt, they go through the Red Sea. Here they are, okay, they send out the spies. Right, we remember this. Twelve spies, ten come back. We say there's no way. There's no way we're gonna be able to take this land that the Lord promised us, that the Lord told us will be ours. There is no way that we can do it. And what happened? But they and their fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They stiffened their necks. Now, some of you may know this about me. Um, I love the gym. Like, I love going to the gym. Honestly, my wife can get annoyed with it sometimes, okay? I'm just gonna be honest. Like, if, you, if I'm not here at work, if I'm not at home with the family, I'm at the gym. You wanna hang out 6 a.m. Tuesday? Come on out. We'll lift some weights, all right? But anyways, so I was in the gym the other day and I'm, I'm, I'm doing, it's a chest day, and you know, chest day is like every day, okay? If you go to the gym, every day is chest day, because no one wants to do leg day. And so I'm in there, and I'm hitting chest, and I'm just getting warmed up, and so I, I reach down to grab the dumbbell, and I go like this, and I hear a pop. I'm like, oh. You know, I kind of reach back to my neck, give it a little rub, and I'm like, I'll be fine. I'm only on my fourth set. This is just getting started. We can't do this. I took pre-workout. This is not going to be good. We're going to push through this thing. So I sit back and, and I power through for like five more sets. And then I turn my neck this way and I got this burning pain in my neck. I want to keep going. But I'm like, I got to stop. I got to stop. And so guess what I have been dealing with every single day this week since Tuesday? I have been dealing with a stiff neck where I'm walking, talking to someone. I'm like, hey, how you doing? Hi. I tried driving the car and I'm like this. Archer's like waving in the mirror. I'm like, no, I'm just trying to see what's back there, bud. I'm trying to see if I can get over. All week I'm dealing with this stick, stiff neck, but why? I knew inherently that I should have stopped. The moment that I reached down and I grabbed that dumbbell and felt that pop, I know that I should have put it down. I know that I should have stopped, gone home, put some heat and ice on it, and I wouldn't wake up this morning with a stiff neck. But I didn't care. I was being prideful. I was being selfish. I was being disobedient to what I knew was best. And that is what the people of Israel are doing here as they have stiffened their necks. They are saying, God, we know better. We want it our way. 
we know that you have a plan, but our plan is better. I know you made a promise, but we know an easier way to do it. We know what's comfortable for us, what's convenient for us. And so they are stiffening their necks to the Lord. And at the end of verse 17, it says, But you are a God ready to forgive gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. Even in their disobedience, even though they refused to obey, even though they had stiffened their necks to the Lord, what is happening as, as, as the people of Israel, right, they're assembled, they're reading this and the leaders are reminding them of their history. They are reminding them of their history. Look at what happened with Abraham. God was faithful in his promise. Look what happened in Egypt with Moses, with the promise of the land. They were disobedient and stiff in their necks, but God forgave. He was gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, and did not forsake them. And he did not forsake them. And we continue on in verse 19. It says, you are great in mercies. You did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouths and gave them water for thirst. Check this out in verse 21. 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. It's not hyperbole, church. That is the Lord keeping his promise. That is the Lord being slow to anger, being abounding in steadfast love to his people and not forsaking them. They wandered for 40 years. They were fed, their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. I mean, do we grasp the brevity of that? You see how good the Lord is that he sustains their daily needs no matter what, no matter how much they stiffened their neck towards him, how much they continued to disobey his commands, his statues, his promises, no matter how much they said in their hearts and in their minds and in their actions that God, our way is better than your way. He still sustained them for 40 years in the desert. It's just, it's incredible. And so we continue on and we get out of the desert, right? 40 years and we come to the time of Joshua and conquest with the judges. And it says there, in verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples allotted to them every corner. And so they took possession of the land of Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, right? Going back to the promise of Abraham, church, going back to the promise that he made. You multiplied their children as the stars in the heaven. You brought them into the land that you had told their fathers they would enter and possess. He is still faithful. He kept his promise. Here is the promised land. Even in your disobedience, what happens? They still took hold of the land that was promised to them from the Lord. And so the, defend, the descendants went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land. The Canaanites gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and rich lands. And we end, it says, so they ate and were filled, became fat, and delighted themselves in your great goodness. 
Took him a long time to see that promise come through. Took him a long time to enter into that promised land. But what happened? The Lord was faithful. The Lord was steadfast. The Lord did not forsake them. Here it is, church, verse 26. Nevertheless, what happened? Nevertheless, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you, cast your law behind their back, killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. I can just picture the people of Israel standing there in sackcloth, covered in dirt, as their leaders are reading on the steps of the assembly, their history, the history that had been passed down to them from generation and generation. And even in their own hearts, they're reading this, and they got to be thinking to themselves, why did we continue to act that way? Why were we disobedient? Do we not understand and see the cycle that is happening for us? Do we not see that when we simply humble ourselves and align ourselves with the covenant that we made with the Lord being obedient to his word and his commands, that what we are going to experience is his great goodness? But nevertheless, they were disobedient. Nevertheless, they were disobedient in what happened. Therefore, in verse 27... You gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And for those of us who know the book of Judges, it is this endless cycle of disobedience. It is this continuation. It is the cycle of disobedience that was true for the entirety of the people of Israel. Where they would follow the Lord. They would truly be worshiping. They would be aligned with him. They would renew their covenant with him and they would live out that covenant obligation with their heavenly father. But nevertheless, they would stiffen their necks. They would stiffen their necks and become disobedient. They would think that their way was better than his way. And what would happen is that the Lord would allow their oppressors to come in and they would overrun them. They would take them captive. They would take away their possessions. And then when they are truly in rock bottom, what do they do? The same thing that we decide to do when we finally hit rock bottom, right? Cry out to the Lord. They cry out to the Lord. And they say, God, save us, rescue us, send us a savior to get us out of this oppression. And what would the Lord do? The Lord was ready to forgive. He was gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he did not forsake them time and time again. Pick up in verse 29. It says, You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously. They did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. For many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through the prophets, yet they would not give an ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the people of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. And so we come to the end of the history here, to this moment where we find the people of Israel here in Nehemiah. Here in Nehemiah chapter 9, the leaders have gone through, working through the history of Abraham, the promise to Father Abraham, working through Egypt with Moses and Exodus, leading through the Red Sea, leading into the wilderness as he continues to provide for them for 40 years, and then them entering into the promised land. And as they have this great conquest over, under Joshua, 
but then they go through the cycle of disobedience through judges. And here they are at a time where now they are crying out in confession and repentance. And so we pick up in verse 20, 32. As we begin this time of repentance from the people of Israel. Now therefore our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. They are confessing the reality of their sin and disobedience, church. The people of Israel are proclaiming boldly that they have acted wickedly, that they have stiffened their necks, that they have been disobedient. They are claiming it aloud and worshiping the Lord and saying, you are faithful, God. You have been steadfast. You have kept your promise. Not one time has he at all changed a word that he said he would do for them. Our kings, our princes, our priests, our fathers here in verse 34 have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warning that you gave even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruits, its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves and its riches and its rich yields go to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over the livestock and as they please, we are in great distress. And so here they are crying out to the Lord, admitting and confessing their sins, seeking repentance. And then what do they do? It says in verse 38, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. I love history. I love studying American history. I love studying, you know, the history of the church. Um, I, and so I was watching a documentary, um, an, uh, an American documentary the other night called National Treasure. And uh, on June 11th, 1776, the Committee of Five was formed. On June 11th, 1776, the Committee of Five was selected and created, and their task was to create a document that would be presented to the world. It was a document that was going to be written and given to the world that would truly change the course of history forever. Now, these five gentlemen were John Adams, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, Ben Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. It was through the work of this committee over the course of three weeks. They had three separate drafts that were created. And over the course of July 3rd into July 4th, the Declaration of Independence was adopted into Congress. Now on the Declaration of Independence, 56 men signed their name, put into writing physically, putting their lives on the line, saying that they affirm the words within this declaration, within this paper, this covenant, saying, declaring our independence from England. I love this because as, as, as I read what the people of Israel are doing, 
the leaders, the princes, the Levites, the priests, they are putting it down on paper. They are putting their money where their mouth is, if you will. They are putting to action this confession of their sins, a confession of repentance, saying, Lord, we have truly been disobedient. We have stiffened our necks to you, but here we are, a broken people a people who is caught in their sin, who is being oppressed. And Father God, we cry out to you and we declare to you on this day by written, sealed covenant that we are going to renew our walk with you, Father. That this day we are making this covenant that we will no longer stiffen our necks to your commands and your statues, Lord but we will walk in your word. We will be obedient to your word and your command in our lives. And they put that in a firm covenant of writing and sealed the document. And during this time, when they would take a signet ring, when they would put a seal on there, that was a promise that was being made. And so here the people of Israel are declaring before the Lord, that this is their covenant promise to him. That they will not sin. They will not fall into sin and temptation to go their own way, but they will be obedient to his law, to his commands. This morning, as we reflect here in Nehemiah chapter nine on the people of Israel, as we reflect through the history, I wanna ask you, have you confessed your sin to the Lord? Have you confessed your sins to the Lord? In 1 John chapter nine, or 1 John 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, we are called to confess, to declare aloud our sins to the Lord because he is faithful. He will not forsake you. He will forgive you because he is righteous and steadfast in his love. A love in Acts chapter two as the church is being born. Peter gets up at Pentecost. I imagine it's much like a time like this as the people of Israel are gathered here in Nehemiah chapter nine and he gets up and he shares this incredible gospel message. And as the people of Israel are gathered, just as they're gathered here in Nehemiah chapter nine, he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and they are struck in their hearts, realizing, oh my goodness, the savior, the Messiah that we have waited for for so long we just nailed to a cross. And in Acts chapter two, verse 36, Peter says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. I love this, just as the people of Israel, Nehemiah chapter nine, are cut to the heart. They're covered in sackcloth and dirt. And the people said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone who the Lord has called to himself. We must confess our sins, church, and then we must repent. We must truly cry out to our Father, seeking his forgiveness, not just owning up to and claiming and confessing our sins, but seek that forgiveness from the Lord. And then here we are 
at the end of Nehemiah chapter 9, making a covenant, renewing our walk with the Lord. And I just want to remind you of this truth here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. We read, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, I want you to know this, church. This does not mean that every time that you sin, that you mess up, that you wander, that we have to say, Lord God, I want you to come back into my heart. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. No, we do not need to accept Jesus Christ back into our hearts every single time that we sin and we mess up. No, I want you to be assured as Romans 10, 9 says that when you confess and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just as it says here in 1 John 4, 15, when you confess Jesus Christ as your risen Savior, you are sealed, you are a follower, you are his child, you are in a covenant relationship with our risen Savior. That happens the moment that you truly confess and believe but we are called to renew, to refocus. That's what we did this morning through communion. We refocused our walk on the Lord instead of walking around, right? Stiffening our necks to the Lord. No, we look at him straight. We follow obediently in the path that he has laid before us. So this morning, church, It is my challenge, my encouragement, my desire that we as his people, as his children would humble ourselves, that we would confess our sins, that we would declare them aloud to the Lord, that we would seek his forgiveness that we would truly ask him to forgive our stiff-necked disobedience towards his commands, towards his word, and that we would renew our covenant with him, church. Because that is what the people of Israel are doing. Now we know the rest of the story. Were they perfect? No. They fall back into that cycle, just like we fall back into that cycle every single day. But just as the people of Israel looked back at their history and remembered the Lord's goodness, may we remember his goodness to us. And may we renew that covenant. And may today we step in obedience and continue to walk faithfully with our risen Savior. Would you pray with me, church? God, we come before you. Father, I thank you. I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the work that you did through Abraham, the work that you did through Moses, through Joshua, through the judges, through Nehemiah, through Ezra, Father through the apostles, God. The same work that you worked and did through them, you are doing through us, Father. God, just as the people of Israel were disobedient and they confessed and repented, Father, may you hear our confession. For the times when we stiffen our necks, when we decide that, man, we have this figured out. Father, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us as a church, as a people, as your children? And may we declare today a renewal of our walks with you, that we would realign our lives with you, Father God, and that we would walk in step in obedience with your spirit and with what you have planned. Father God, I ask that you keep us steadfast in your word as you keep your promises steadfast to us. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.